Good afternoon. My name is Michael Sparks, and today I'm going to be talking about an applied investigation into the current state of battery technology today. Uh, to start off, I'm going to speak a little bit about my motivations for this project, and then I'm going to work my way through uh, a little overview about battery, te battery technology today, talk about some of the challenges of current batteries you'll see today, a little bit about my testing equipment, something about my experimental methods. I'm going to show you uh, the mass amounts of uh, data analysis that we used uh, to uh, just crunch through all the numbers that we uh, created using our uh, equipment. Talk about how I determined internal resistance for all my tested batteries. Then we're going to go through my conclusion, acknowledgments, and references. Uh, to start out, uh, as an example, to kind of um, uh, bring this into something a little bit more realistic for you to uh, rationalize. Say you have a uh, speaker system that draws 400 milliamps of uh, current when it's operating and has an uh, operational voltage between 10.5 10 volts and 17 volts. This is a little bit of a price comparison between um, uh, three different battery types. You've got alkalines, lead acids, and uh, these um, new high-tech uh, A123 systems, uh, lithium iron nanophosphate cells that um, I'm actually very interested in and I'll be talking about later. As you can see, if you are a general consumer and you probably just want to use these once you're going to the beach, your best choice, outlined in green, would be to go with the eight D-cell alkaline batteries. That will get you $21.15, cheapest of the three options. And it would also get you 30 hours of life on that one uh, cycle. Now, if you wanted to run this speaker continuously for 100 weeks nonstop, and you were still looking for uh, the, the most beneficial cost, alkalines would be way out of proportion. And your best choice would be to go with uh, something that's very common in cars today, which would be the lead acid battery. Now, on the other hand, if you wanted to run it for 500 weeks continuously, which is kind of a wild number, but it's the uh, only uh, number that I can, or the only amount of time I can give you to show the benefit of uh, lithium iron nanophosphate batteries, uh, your best choice would be the A123 cells, which even after 500 weeks of continuous um, running, you still don't have to change your batteries. All you have to do is recharge them. Similar with the lead acid batteries, all you have to do is recharge them, but the lead acid batteries will eventually uh, become useless after a period of time in which their uh, capacity slowly decreases. I'm here, I have a little quote that was uh, recently said by Honda Research and Development about two months ago. It says, we lack confidence. It is questionable if consumers are prepared for the annoyances of, of lengthy charge times and limited range in their vehicles. So they're, they're not sure that the battery technology is up to par with uh, the demands of consumers right now. So they're saying they need, they need a battery that charges faster, and they need, a they need a battery that has better range. That is a good benefit of, uh, in the center you have the lithium iron nanophosphate batteries and a prismatic cell type. This right here, your uh, cell phone battery, your, uh, uh, your laptop battery, a lot of them are prismatic cells which is, in which it is a flat cell rather than a cylindrical cell, which is uh, what you can see later. But um, these nanophosphate cells, they, um, uh, they're purported to have extremely high, uh, um, you can discharge them at very high currents, and they also have an extremely long cycle life. So they, um, you can use them more times than your typical lithium ion battery, and you can discharge them a lot quicker. Here are a couple of the challenges that you're going to see with current batteries. Lithium cobalt, that's what you have right here and in most of your cell phones, probably also your laptops. It, um, it, it doesn't exactly have low cycle life, it has an all right cycle life. It's very toxic, it's a safety hazard. You don't want to pierce these. You don't want to, if you're driving a car that's powered on a lithium cobalt, such as the uh, Tesla, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's a new electric car. If you crash that into a wall and it doesn't have the, doesn't have the proper uh, protective circuits, it will blow up in a very uh, extreme fashion compared to a typical crash you might see with uh, your general automotive car. Next, we have the lead acid battery. It has low cycle life, low energy density. It's really heavy, and you can't discharge it at a very high rate. And the third cell here, I have the A123 Systems uh, Lithium Iron Nanophosphate Batteries. Although um, it's, these nanophosphate batteries, they, uh, they're very safe. They, um, they're a lot safer than lithium cobalt, although they still are dangerous. As you can see in the top right, here's a Honda Prius that was, uh, had a battery pack built with lithium iron nanophosphate cells. And even though that these cells are so much safer than all the other lithium technologies, they were still capable of uh, igniting and uh, creating fire due to uh, faulty connection by the person who built the uh, car. Next, I'm going to talk about my testing equipment. The, uh, the main device used here was the West Mountain Radio Computerized Battery Analyzer 3. It is USB powered and it plots out a different data point for every single second. 
A uh, great benefit of this thing is uh, we could discharge a battery and leave it running overnight for days and days without having to monitor it personally. So it saved a lot of time and it was uh, very useful. Also, the data could go right to, uh, right to Excel and I could pop it from Excel into MATLAB once I organized it. Next, um, we have multiple different cells of many different chemistries. We needed, a, we needed an efficient way to charge all those different cell types without having to buy a specific charger for each cell because that would be costly. So purchasing this uh, Turnigy AccuCell 6 charger, we were able to, uh, pro it pro it's pre-programmed to charge uh, different cell types or different chemistry types, and it was very useful. Some of my experimental methods, I weighed each battery, I calculated the volume of each battery, I, uh, did, in, I did uh, some testing and uh, made some measurements to calculate the internal resistance for each battery. I also did a low current discharge to determine maximum amp hour rating, and I did a high current discharge to uh, help me determine how fast I could actually discharge this battery. Here's a little data comparison of all the, the uh, data I collected. Um, here on rated, in the rated column, those are the numbers I pulled off data sheets. In the tested columns, those are the numbers that I pulled through uh, experimental research personally. Um, as you can see, the lithium iron nanophosphate battery is the second column. It has the lowest internal resistance of all of these batteries, and that's another reason that you can discharge it at such a high rate, and also another reason that it has such a, um, such a high cycle life compared to the other batteries. And as, you can also see that it also, um, in terms of ever, error, it was pretty on par with uh, what it was rated for. Um, and Unfortunately for the lithium polymer battery, I was unable to pull any uh, rated numbers because the lithium polymer battery I used was actually out of my cell phone. For the next, here we have the uh, lithium iron, uh, just the generic lithium, lithium iron phosphate battery without the nanotechnology. As you can see, the, uh, the, the half amp discharge seems to have done pretty well. The 10 amp discharge was all right. But when I tried to discharge it at an extremely high current, 16 and a half amps, it uh, failed completely. Here on, the, on the other hand, the lithium iron uh, phosphate battery using nanotechnology discharged it at up to 40 amps and it still reached its um, rated capacity. Also on this chart, I have the uh, charging curve. I, charge, I did a charge cycle using the uh, battery charger. I charged it at one amp and I discharged it at one amp. Using MATLAB and finding the area under both those curves, we found that the efficiency of uh, the, the, the charge efficiency was 99%. So out of, the, out of all the energy that we put into the battery that we used to charge it, using the charger curve, 99% of that energy we were able to uh, take out of it. So that is very good. Here we have a uh, lithium manganese nickel. Um, it did just on par. Everything was just as expected. And uh, as a side note, all of these discharge curves you're seeing here are also going to be seen on a Ragone chart. Each curve is, is its own point on the Ragone chart. Here we have lithium polymer. This is my cell phone battery. Um, it did pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, I had a couple problems with faulty connections. It was very difficult to solder to those little tabs right there. So in the middle of my test right here, it disconnected several times and I had to rush to put it back together, but still, it fortunately uh, seems to have done pretty well. Here's my Ragone chart. I uh, put a real Ragone chart up, or Ragone chart, my, my bad, up for comparison. Here are three different alkaline discharge curves you have, and then you can also see where they correspond with the Rigoni chart on the right. So my experimental data actually uh, lined up pretty well with uh, what you'd expect for a uh, Rigoni chart. You have the lithium batteries here, and then you have the lithium chemistries here. These squares right here are the lithium iron nanophosphate batteries, which were capable of being, being discharged up to 40 amps. And then right here is when I discharged the, uh, the generic lithium iron phosphate battery at 16 and a half amps. And as you can see, it did not, uh, it cannot compare with the power density of the lithium iron nanophosphate batteries. And then my batteries, which were best for energy density, turned out to be my, uh, my cell phone battery and uh, the cylindrical lithium manganese nickel battery that I discharged. Here's a little, uh, here's a table on, on how I calculated internal resistance. I did that taking three measurements. What we did first is we took the open circuit voltage of the battery. We um, also took, we also had a known resistor because we took Right here is a resistor that we, um, we, determined, uh, we, term we determined its value based on what the expected value of the internal resistance of the battery was. So we know, we know the value of this resistor, we know the open circuit bat voltage of the battery, and you find that by taking a voltmeter hooking up to the battery. And we also know with the use of that voltmeter right there what the voltage drop is across the resistor. Using those three measurements, you can then calculate internal resistance. And here is an image right here of uh, 
what I actually did. You have the battery right there. This is a large resistor. It's about um, it's about uh, seven or ten different uh, high power resistors hooked up in parallel. And then um, the test begins when I hook that wire up right there, and then the circuit is completed. Uh, to conclude, um, I plan on doing several things with uh, batteries in the future. To begin, um, I'd like to eventually team up with UB Robotics, and because um, they're currently uh, they, they currently use lead acid batteries. That's the uh, power pack right there. And uh, once again, they're about to th those lead acid batteries have reached the end of their cycle, as expected, because they don't have a large cycle life compared to lithium iron nanophosphate cells. So I'm planning on hopefully um, getting enough research and enough uh, backing to eventually uh, find a cost-efficient solution to replace these batteries. Um, I'm also going to be looking into possibly powering uh, to start, you know, got to start off slow, start off maybe an electric scooter, an e-bike. Um, I'm going to also, I'd also like to look into more cutting edge batteries such as the lithium iron nanophosphate batteries. Those are some um, rare cells that uh, it was quite difficult to acquire. Um, I'm also going to look into prismatic cells because uh, all, all my tests here were mostly uh, cylindrical cells. And then I'm also going to, if I can roll that, ooh, that's bad. As Derek was talking about how temperature came into play with his batteries, taking a look at this discharge curve right here, I don't have the video today, but as over time, the temperature of these cells increased and also the voltage did. So I'd also, look, I'd also like to look into in the future if uh, higher temperature is actually a good thing for certain batteries depending on your application. And. Uh, for acknowledgments, I'd like to thank uh, CSTEP faculty and staff. I'd like to say thank Shauna Kronk Owens. I'd like to thank uh, Daniel Muffaletto, uh, my, my advisor, uh, Jennifer Zernheld, uh, my partners, Derek Brim and Antonio Upia, and that will be it.